Okay, we're very happy to have Carl Herbacek here to speak on multi-level non-standard analysis, the axiom of choice, and recent work of Renling Jin. Go ahead. Well, thank you for inviting me. So I will be talking about non-standard analysis and its relationship to the axiom of choice with particular uh, emphasis on the multi-level uh, situation. So non-standard analysis is uh, sometimes criticized for its implicit dependence on the axiom of choice. For example, Bishop in his infamous review of Kiesler's uh, uh, calculus textbook, Alan Kahn and others. So let's see what the complaint is. Well, the model theoretic framework for non-standard methods does require the existence of non-principal ultra filters over N, which uh, many people consider a strong form of the axiom of choice. Why is that? Well, suppose you have the hyperreals. Uh, that means you have a mapping star that assigns to each set of natural numbers its non-standard extension star x. And uh, suppose you have a non-standard integer nu in star n minus n. Well, then the set u consisting of those subsets of n uh, such that nu belongs to their star is easily seen using transfer to be a non-principal ultra filter over n. Now, the other uh, approach to non-standard analysis is axiomatic. Uh, for example, N Nelson's IST is the best known. And uh, there, uh, these theories, uh, non-standard set theories, uh, postulate the axiom of choice. Uh, so we could, of course, drop it, but that doesn't solve the problem. Uh, the reason is that they also postulate uh, some version of standardization principle. Now, the standardization principle is sort of a generalization of uh, collect, uh, comprehension or separation uh, to arbitrary formulas in the language, not just the set formulas with epsilon, but formulas with epsilon and st. Uh, what it says is that if phi is any such formula with arbitrary parameters, and if A is a standard set, then there is a standard set S that has exactly this, whose standard elements are exactly the standard elements of A that have the property phi. Uh, and the usual notation that I will use is this for this set. So if the formula is just uh, in the language of set in, in the epsilon language, and if the parameters are standard, this is just a separation of ZFC. Uh, now it turns out that from this standardization principle, one gets ultra filters by the same argument essentially. Take an unlimited natural number u new, and uh, let u be the standard set whose standard elements are those subsets of n that contain new. And that's a non-principal ultra filter over n. So in this sense, all results that have been obtained in non-standard analysis in uh, either the model theoretic or the axiomatic framework depend on the axiom of choice. Is that a problem? Well, strong forms of the axiom of choice, of course, are routinely used and necessary in many abstract areas of mathematics, general topology, uh, measure theory, function analysis, and so on. But it's perhaps undesirable to have to rely on them for results in ordinary mathematics, calculus, finite combinatorics, and, and number theory. Now, I'm not saying that proving a number theoretic theorem using axiom of choice uh, is not valid. Uh, of course, we have Shenfield's absoluteness theorem, and the consequence of that is that uh, any pi one four sentence that's proved provable in ZFC is also provable in ZF. Uh, but uh, to get a, from a proof to ZFC to a proof in ZF in this way is certainly not trivial or even ob obvious. So what can be done about this? Well, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, uh, Misha Katz and I uh, worked on this problem and we published a paper where we formulated a non-standard set theory we call SPOT. And uh, this theory SPOT 
is a conservative extension of ZF. That means that arguments carried out in spot do not depend on the axiom of choice in any way. Uh, of course, uh, to get such a theory, we have to weaken standardization and one has to watch for that. But it turns out that infinitesimal analysis can be carried out in spot in pretty much the usual way, uh, uh, except for occasional at attention to the uh, standardization axiom. I'll say more about this later, hopefully. Um, now, in some proofs in ordinary mathematics, one uses uh, the axiom of countable choice or the axiom of dependent choice. Uh, for example, in proving the equivalence of the uh, epsilon delta definition and the sequential definition of continuity or the countable additivity of Lebesgue measure. Now, these axioms, although forms of the axiom of choice, I call them weak forms, uh, they are generally accepted and often used uh, by working mathematicians without any comments. But so to take that into account, we also consider a stronger theory, Scott, which is essentially spot plus the axiom of dependent choice. Okay, so let me just say what the axioms of these theories are and a little bit about them. Uh, first of all, when I say an epsilon language, I mean language that contains the epsilon predicate of set theory and uh, can be enriched by defined symbols for constants, relations, functions, and so on. For example, the epsilon language has a name n for the set of natural numbers and has a name r for the set of real numbers. These are viewed as defined in the usual way. So n is the least inductive set, r is the uh, R is defined by Cauchy sequences or the Deccan cuts or whatever. Uh, now, in non-standard set theories, we add to this language, to this epsilon language, a unary predicate ST, STX reads X is standard, and possibly other things, we will see that. And uh, generally, uh, the viewpoint is that standard infinite sets contain also non-standard elements. So for example, the set R of all real numbers contains infinitesimals and unlimited reals. The set N of natural numbers contains the standard set of natural numbers, contains non-standard unlimited natural numbers, and so <laughs> on. It's just a shift in view from the uh, model theoretic uh, viewpoint to which uh, most people may be uh, used, but uh, one gets used to this. So having said all this, I can state the axioms of spot. Well, besides zermelo frankel where of course it's understood that uh, separation and replacement apply only to formulas in the epsilon language, we have three non-standard axioms, transfer, which says that if you have a formula phi with standard parameters, and it's an epsilon formula, then if for all standard x phi, then it follows that for all x phi. So this is uh, this basically says that the standard universe is an elementary subuniverse of the universe of all sets. It follows from this anyway. Uh, so that's uh, the basic axiom of non-standard uh, approach. Uh, then we have, of course, non-triviality. That means uh, there is a non-standard natural number. And finally, uh, we have a vestige of standardization, uh, which we call standard, which is usually called standard part. And what it says is that for any set A, standard or not, there is a standard set B of natural numbers such that B and A have the same standard elements. So this is um, a very special case of standardization. It's over a set of natural numbers and the formula is, is very simple. It implies very easily that uh, standardization holds in spot for all epsilon formulas with arbitrary parameters. 
Now, an equivalent form of this SP is uh, perhaps more familiar and uh, often used. It simply says that every limited real number has a standard part. For every limited real number, there is a standard real number uh, to which it is infinitely closed. So the meaning of these concepts is the usual one. And uh, I will call this uniquely determined standard real number, the shadow of, of X. Okay, so uh, uh, just a remark that spot is really just an extension to all of ZF of, of some insights that Leibniz already had about real numbers. Namely, Leibniz distinguished between assignable and inassignable numbers. So we distinguish between standard and non-standard sets. Two, uh, Leibniz understood transfer uh, we, he called it the law of continuity. What is true about finite is true about infinite and vice versa. Uh, of course, he assumed that there are infinitesimals. And finally, uh, he talked about equality up to infinitesimals uh, and he, he talked about discarding the infinitesimals and that's just taking the standard part. So perhaps we should call this theory Leibniz theory, but I don't know if that would be uh, historically appropriate, let's say. So anyway, that's the theory spot. Uh, I will have to skip over uh, some slides that go into details of what can be proved in spot because I would run out of time. So I'll just say that one can add two additional special cases of standardization, namely standardization for formulas with no parameters or equivalently for formulas with standard parameters, and that's for uh, that's over any set, not just the set of natural numbers, and uh, for any st epsilon formulas, not just epsilon formulas. And the second special case is standardization over standard finite sets, which is not very surprising. If you have a standard finite set, then there is a standard set that has the same standard elements uh, that has the whose standard elements are just those described by some <clears throat> property phi. So that of course is obvious uh, in the model theoretic viewpoint. In general, the, the whole standardization is obvious in the model theoretic viewpoint because in the model theoretic viewpoint, you work inside of ZFC and standard set is just uh, some collection, you know, defined by some uh, formula in ZFC. So. Uh, there it is not an issue, but in the axiomatic framework, this is a crucial axiom. Okay, now finally, yeah, so spot plus is spot plus this, and we have proved with Misha and I that a spot plus is a conservative extension of ZF. We have also proved that if we add to spot plus a version of the axiom of dependent choice, which I won't spend time on, is just the usual dependent choice for ST epsilon formulas, then one, get a, one gets a theory Scott, which is a conservative extension of ZS plus ADC. And in this theory, one can, for example, uh, construct Lebesgue measure in the one of the infinite similar ways that have been discovered long ago. So uh, I better move to many levels of standardness because I promised to uh, focus this talk on that. Um, the first theories with many levels of standardness have been, the first one was developed by Perrier. Uh, the main paper is in 1992. I worked on this, uh, my main paper is from 2009. And uh, the main feature of these theories is that the unary standardness predicate the standard is subsumed under a binary relative standardness predicate SR UV. Uh, v is standard relative to U. Um, v is standard relative to zero is the same thing as V is standard. Okay, so uh, what is the point of these theories? Well, uh, for example, uh, they, they make the non-standard methods applicable to all 
sets, not just the standard sets. For example, the non-standard definition of the derivative, which you all have seen, uh, uh, in the usual one-level approach, uh, it only works if f is a standard function and a is a standard number. Otherwise, well, it doesn't work. Uh, but in the multi-level approach, it works for arbitrary f and a, provided one understands that infinitesimal means infinitesimal relative to the level where f and a occur, and the standard part is taken relative to the level where f and a occur. So you can, for any function f and any real number a, standard or non-standard, you can give the non-standard definition of the derivative. And we have actually, uh, with Lessman and O'Donovan, we, we have a book that presents calculus in this way. But I really want to talk about uh, something else, namely the way non-standard analysis with many levels of standardness has been used in combinatorics and number theory, in particular by Renling in in a recent amazing proof of Semredi's theorem, uh, which is done in a model theoretic framework that has three levels of standardness or infinity. Just to recall, Semredi's theorem says that if D is a set of natural numbers with a positive upper density, then D contains arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, the, yeah, the paper has been published recently and uh, I recommend the editorial introduction by Terence Tao also. Okay, now Yin work, Yin's work uses multi-level non-standard analysis in a way that goes beyond uh, the features postulated by these theories because in addition to transfer, that means basically an elementary embedding from one level to a higher level, it also has other non-trivial elementary embeddings that are crucial to the arguments. So uh, first we have to describe a non-standard set theory with many levels of standardness. Uh, I have I was planning to motivate this by recalling how ultra, ultra powers and iterated ultra powers work, but uh, I realized at the last minute that if I do that, I will never get to the interesting things. So I'll have to skip all this and talk about spots, which is the extension of spot to many levels of standardness. Okay, the language We'll have, again, a binary predicate epsilon, binary predicate symbol relative for relative standardness, and also a ternary function symbol for uh, the relevant isomorphisms. But uh, it is much easier to understand if one uses classes, so class terminology. So I will stick to that. Uh, let S sub A, so S sub A is the universe of all a standard sets, standard relative to A, let's say, and I A B is going to be the isomorphism between the universe of A standard sets and the universe of B standard sets if, if A and B have the same cardinality. Uh, so I, I will call these A's and B labels, put variables A and B aside for labels, and uh, I will assume that they range over standard finite subsets of N. So the various um, uh, kinds of standardness are labeled by standard finite subsets of N. If the set A happens to be a natural numbers, we natural number, we talk about N standard sets as sets at the nth level of standardness. Okay, so the axioms, oh yeah, uh, uh, some further notation, R plus A is just, this is just the Minkowski addition, is the set of all R plus S for S element A, that means all the elements of A are shifted by R, and if phi is any formula in the language, and R is a natural number, then phi upper R is the shift 
is this formula phi shifted by R. That, that means each occurrence of A standard sets is replaced by R plus A standard sets and each occurrence of an isomorphism between SA and SB is replaced by an isomorphism between SR sub A and SR plus B. So all the levels are shifted by R. Okay, so this is just notation. Now come the axioms. So there is there is there are structural axioms that just describe how these uh, classes fit together and uh, that they fit together in the expected way. That means if A is a subset of A prime, then A standard sets are A prime standard. Uh, this I, if A and A prime and A double prime have the same cardinality, then these I, A, A prime behave like isomorphisms. So I, A, A prime is an isomorphism between S sub A and S sub A prime, which preserves the epsilon relation. That's this uh, formula here. If X is in Z, then I of X is in I of Z. Uh, or I, A, A is the identity. I, A prime A is the inverse of I, A, A prime. And we have the composition in the obvious way. We also have coherence in the sense that if a is if B is a subset of A, then the isomorphism on B agrees with the isomorphism on A in this way. So I won't really need this. So, well, I will do uh, do, do actually need this prop property. So maybe I should restate it. If if A and A prime have the same cardinality, which means that the isomorphism between S sub A and S sub A prime is defined. And if B is a subset of A, well, take the image of B by the order preserving map, call it B prime. Then we have an isomorphism between B, a sub B and a sub B prime. And this, this restriction of A sub A super A prime to B ag agrees with the isomorphism on a sub B. So this is, um, again, people familiar with Iterated ultra powers will recognize this is just uh, describing uh, the universes uh, of sets which have uh, support A and the way they fit together in the iterated ultra power. But I better move on. So uh, the additional important axioms are, of course, we have transfer generalized to the S sub A's. So if X1, XK are from the a standard sets universe, then if for every A standard set X, the formula phi holds, then for all X, the formula phi holds. Uh, phi is an epsilon formula. So that's just a generalization of transfer. Uh, the more important, more, very important axiom is this homogeneous shift, which works for any formula. It basically says, if you take the universe of A standard sets, and take some elements in it, x bar, and take their image, and by the isomorphism that shifts all the levels by r, so you get i of x bar, then the formula phi holds about the original x bar, if and only if the shifted formula holds about the, the shifted x bar, so to say, the image of x bar. So this follows from the uh, factoring lemma of the, uh, theory of alter products. Uh, an alter product of an alter product can be viewed as an alter product of the first one in the sense of the second one or vice versa, depending on your conventions. Okay, one last axiom. Yeah, I won't spend time on this. One last axiom asserts that we have, end as the levels increase, we have end extensions and a little bit more Perhaps this is the way to understand it. If n is a natural number that's a standard, then it's either standard, that means zero standard, or it's greater than every natural numbers at the levels uh, smaller than a. So it's a uh, extension of the end extension principle. All right, now spots is the theory spot plus with these additional axioms. Scots is the theory Scott with these additional axioms with some non-trivial, with some modifications, obvious modifications. 
to apply the axioms to all formulas in the new language. Now, the result I have is that Scots is a conservative extension of ZF plus ADC. Uh, it is unfortunately still an open question whether spots is a conservative extension of ZF. I believe it, but if I have time, I will be able to indicate why this is still a conjecture. The proof is complicated, if there is one. So um, instead of dwelling on these things, let me give you, let me describe to you Yin's proof of Ramsey's theorem in spots. This is a proof Yin, running in presented at the uh, meeting in Pisa this summer. Uh, it is entirely his proof. I just changed the terminology and adapted and took care of the issues with standardization. So Ramsey's theorem, you recall, uh, says that given a coloring of n tuples by r colors, uh, there exists an infinite set H such that all n tuples from H have the same color. Okay. I already said this, so let's do the proof. It's We can assume that n, the n tuples, r, the colors, and c, the coloring, are all standard because then the, the result follows by transfer. So let i be the shift by one level, shift of the levels 0, 1, up to n minus 1, to levels 1 to n. Okay, so it's a, it shifts all the levels up to n minus one by one. Uh, fix new, which is one standard, but not standard. Non-triviality tells us such news exist. Now define the n tuple x bar, x1, x2, xn as follows. Start with new, so x1 is new, and then each subsequent value is, is the image of the previous value by r. So xi plus one is the image of xi by, by one. Uh, the reason we can do this in spots is because we have standardization over finite sets. So now we have an n-tuple. It's a sort of generic n-tuple in non-technical non terms, non-technical sense. Let C0 be the cover, color of this n-tuple. Now the rest of the proof now produces a sequence of values a1, a2, a3, and so on, uh, which all such that all n tuples from this sequence have the same color as x bar. That means the color c zero. Yeah. So we define this strictly increasing sequence. Uh, now the question mark means that. A priori, I don't know how far this sequence will go. It could be empty, but I will eventually prove that it's infinite. So uh, the recursion goes as far as it goes, and then it stops as far as we care. So the definition, uh, oops, yeah, yeah, good, here. So the definition is as follows. I use a capital A sub M for the set A1, A2, AM. So at stage M plus one, we already have defined capital A sub M. That means we have A1, A2, AM. And we define them in such a way that, forget this, we define them in such a way that any N tuple from A sub M union X bar has the color C0. And what we want to do is we want to find AM plus one so that when we add it to AM union X bar, all the n tuples still have the same color C0. So we define AM plus one to be the least A such that which is bigger than A sub M and it can be added so that all the n tuples still have the same color C0 if it exists. If it doesn't, we stop. We let A be union of these sets. Maybe it's empty for what we know as yet. And that's an internal set. So by uh, standard part axiom, there is a standard set H that has exactly the same, oh, uh, this should be just elements, I guess the bar is, it has exactly the same standard elements as A, and uh, it is clear that uh, all the n tuples from H have the same color C0, because all the elements of H have the same color as C0. So all standard element and tuples in H have the same color as C0, and by transfer all do. 
So what we have to prove still is that the sage set H is infinite. In other words, that for all standard M, A sub M is defined and standard. And that's where it starts not to be nice. Uh, how are we doing on time? Oh, maybe I'll manage this. So, uh, so fix M, suppose you have defined A sub M already. If M is zero, then just ignore A sub M, right? So you have A sub M and uh, you have defined it in such a way that, oh, okay. Um, and consider the following sentence. There exists X in natural number in S sub one, which is bigger than A sub M and all the n tuples from a sub m union the set containing x, ix1, ix and minus one have the same color c0. Now this sentence is true because all you need to do is let x equal x1. And uh, we have chosen x1 to be non-standard. So it's bigger than a sub m and uh, we have chosen we have chosen it so that uh, and by inductive assumption uh, a sub m union the sequence x x one x two up to x n uh, have all the elements of this is is, is um, uni has has, uh, has all the elements have the same color so this sentence is true so now we do the homogeneous shift and conclude that, well, shift all the indices. So conclude that there exists X, which is in S0, which is bigger than A sub M, and all the elements of this set, when it's shifted, have the same color C0. And when you shift this set, well, A sub M are standard, so they stay put, and X, uh, X is quantified, so nothing happens to that. And ix1 shift we shift it back. So ix1 shifted shifts to x1, ixn minus one shifts to xn minus one. So we are applying the inverse of i basically to get from here to here. But the, by homogeneous transfer, this sentence is also true. So so we take the least x with this property, call it a sub m plus one. Note that it's standard because it's in a zero. And now uh, look at the set am plus one together with x1, xn minus one. And uh, we have that all the n tuples in this set have the same color C0. Now what we need to prove is that we can add xn to this because the inductive assumption requires us to show that all this all the n tuples in a m plus one together with x one up to x n have the same color, right? X n minus one is just the n minus one tuple. We have to we have to have the same color as x one x n minus one x n. So that's the thing that has to be proved, and uh, that's done as follows: just take any n tuple from this set, which we are trying to prove that this n tuple b bar has color c0. Well, there are three possibilities. If bn is less than xn, well, then it's less or equal xn minus one. And so uh, from the previous page, you know, it's a subset of n plus one union x1, xn minus one. So uh, it has color c0. If b is x1, well, then B bar is just X bar, which means X1, Xn, and so it also has color C0. So the non-trivial case is when B1 is B1 is not X, is less than X1, in other words, standard, and uh, Bn is Xn, not less than Xn. So this is the non-trivial case. B1 is standard and Bn is Xn. Well, in this case, since B1, Bn are n values and X and B1 is not X less than X1, so B1, X1, Xn is n plus one values, there must be a value X sub P, uh, which is not of the n values X1, X2, Xn, there must be one, we take the largest, which is not in B bar. So XP is the largest value, which is not in B bar. And now we take another, isomorphism, we take an isomorphism which takes 
levels zero up to n minus one keeps the levels zero up to p minus one fixed, but sh shifts level p to p plus one and then so on by one. Yeah, so up to p minus one, everything is fixed. And after that, everything is shifted by one level. So we call this j. And I think this is the end of the proof, the last page of the proof. Uh, am I doing on time? Uh, yeah. So we know that for j less or equal p, j of bj is just bj. Everything is fixed up to the up to the level p. Uh, if j bj is xj, so that's still less than level p. But if j is bigger than p, if j is bigger than p, then bj is the same as xj, and so it gets shifted by one level. Okay. So. Now we again applied the homogeneous shift. We take the level B1, level B bar, B1, B2, Bn, shift it back, get B bar prime. And since B bar is from M, and by the way, I described how this shift works. Well, uh, the most important thing is that Bn gets shifted, Bn is Xn, so it gets shifted to Bn minus one, which is Xn minus one. So we end up, so the shifted B, the B bar prime is an n tuple in Am plus one together with X one up to Xn minus one. Therefore, by what we have proved before, the inductive assumption is it has color C zero and we are done. Okay, so <laughs> beautiful proof of Renling Yin. I gave it because uh, there is no way I could possibly give any details on uh, Renning's proof of Semiradis theorem here, even if I understood them. Uh, but I will say something about it. Uh, so Renning's proof uses of Semiradis theorem uses oh, Carl, 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 can I can yeah? I ask you something here? Oh. Uh, so, so the proof is uniform in N, right? It doesn't seem to be an induction on N in the proof. Exactly, right? there is no induction. Yeah, you just directly exhibit the mm -hmm. homogeneous set. Yeah, it's uniform in N. It uses N levels of standardness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there is no information really on any kind of what the homogeneous set looks set looks like in terms of complexity. No, I would say not. Yeah. No. All right. Okay, so uh, we have what? We have five minutes or ten minutes? Or... Oh no, we have plenty of time. Um, we have plenty of time. Slow so, down. Yeah, it's oh. one. It's one forty right now. Um, so yeah. officially you have twenty, but we can definitely go. We can always stay a little longer. Well, no, I don't want to stay. Oh, no, no. <laughs> okay. We we often uh, go to about to about you know two ten or so. So um, let's okay. say you have thirty minutes. Okay. Well, hey, if you told me that, I would have gone through all the slides. No, I'm kidding. Okay, so I think this is good. So Yin's proof of Semiradis theorem. Um, it's a simple proof in air quotes. It's still very complex, of course, and uh, probably beyond my understanding. But um, anyway, uh, one perhaps doesn't have to understand it to claim that uh, it can be carried out in spots. The reason is that well, I'll explain. So uh, Yin's proof uses four universes. V0, he, he works model theoretically. So he has four universes, which is an ultra product iterated three times uh, of ultra product of some superstructure iterated three times. And it, he has uh, some, he has the natural inclusions, of course, and some additional elementary embeddings. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, he is. Uh, he has written it up very nicely. So he made he made a list of properties that his proof uses. And uh, I will uh, go over these properties briefly. N sub J is simply uh, natural numbers at the level J and R sub J is the real numbers at the level J. So here are the properties and I've reformulated them a little to fit uh, spots, but uh, Basically, this is what they say. 
the universe is each is an elementary substructure of the next so we have transfer from each level to the next level each uh, uh, next level is an end extension of the previous level we have uh, countable idealization which is a principle uh, which says this if you have an epsilon formula with parameters from vj bar and if for every natural number in n sub j there exists x such that for all m less or equal n uh, x is related to m by the property phi then there is a single x which is related to all n from the previous level of standardness by the property phi so this is just countable idealization if you take j equal one then it just says that now if you take j equal zero then it's just the usual countable idealization for every natural if for every standard natural number there exists x which is related to all smaller natural numbers by the property phi then then there is a unique x not standard necessarily uh, such that which is related to all the standard n by the property phi so this countable idealization is a consequence of the axioms of spot uh, for the case j equals zero and uh, what i stated here is a consequence of the axioms of spots for as stated assuming that v0 v1 v2 and v3 are for example the first uh, four levels of standardness okay the next axiom of Remlings is that there is an elementary embedding of v2 into v3 but not just with respect to epsilon formulas but with respect to formulas that involve r0 and r1 now uh, in the language of spots uh, r0 is defined to be the zero standard reals and r1 is defined to be the one standard reals so the principle of homogeneous shift applies to this situation right a statement in this structure is simply a statement that refers to levels of standardness zero and one and the homogeneous shift principle tells you that the same statement holds about the image of the parameters in if you shift the levels by one shift them to r s1 and s2 in other words r1 and r2 so this principle three is a basically special case of the homogeneous shift um, and then there are some just elementary embeddings with respect to epsilon which are just special cases of transfer for various universes and 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 the fact that they are end extensions as i described it so i won't go through these details here uh, uh the point is that the point is that if you choose these universes if you work in spots and choose these universes as i'm describing here and the isomorphisms as i describing here i1 is just the mapping of v0 to e1 i2 keeps v0 fixed but moves v1 into v2 and i star i already said shifts 0 1 to 1 and 2 well then uh, uh, you get all the properties that in onion's list so the only question as far as doing the proof in spots is whether uh, the use of standardization goes beyond its its abilities and if one looks at the proof standardization is used in the proof of the existence of densities so let me recall the way yin defines his densities strong upper banach densities so if a is a subset of net subset of n with unlimited number of elements so now we work in spot let's say right so n has standard and non-standard elements a is a subset of n which is an unlimited number of elements we are defining the strong upper banach density of a well uh, following your handling uh, what we need to do is we look at all subsets of a that are unlimited we look at all p that have an unlimited number of elements uh, look at the 
relative frequency of A and B, that means number of elements A intersect B divided by number of elements of B. That's a non-standard possibility uh, rational number. So it has, and it's bounded by one. So it has a shadow, which is a standard real number. Yeah. So it's the real number that's infinitely close uh, to, to this relative uh, density. And the strong upper Banach density of A is the supremum of the standard set of, the, of all these numbers. Yeah. Now also uh, uh, Renling defines a relativized version of this. So uh, starting with a set S uh, that has uh, uh, density eta and the density, oh, yeah, uh, that has a standard density eta, but densities are standard, they are shadows. And suppose that A is a subset of S, we define the density of A relative to S in the same way, uh, you, we look at the shadow of the relative frequency A intersect P over P for unlimited P, but only such that P are dense in S. In other words, the relative density, uh, I'm sorry, I should say S, are den S is dense in P. So the relative density of S in P has to be infinitely close to Ada. The shadow of this relative density has to be Ada. So that's just a little bit more complicated uh, concept. Uh, but uh, the, the thing to worry about is that here we have sets of real numbers and we have to take their supremum, but these sets cannot be proved to exist in spot because, well, standardization does not apply to sets of reals. If it did, it would, uh, it would give us an ultra filter. So uh, this is a set of reals, right? This, uh, this thing in brackets is an set of reals, this external set of reals described by an ST epsilon formula. And uh, uh, how do we know that it has a supremum? If we don't know that the set is, a, is standard, but how do we know that it has a supremum? Well, that's easy. You just replace this set by a set of rationals and a set of rationals is countable and the rationals are countable. So countable standardization, standard part principle applies and gives us a supremum. So uh, that's a trick that's used in many situations in analysis. Uh, in, when you work in spot, you replace, if you, if you need a supremum of some set of reals, uh, if, you replace, if you can replace that set of reals by a set of rationals, then everything is fine. And the way you replace it is simply straightforward. Uh, you just rewrite the definition as follows. You take, you look all, at all the rationals which have the following property. There is a set P uh, which, which is um, unlimited, has unlimited number of elements and uh, the relative frequency of S in P is infinitely close to Ada. Yeah, yeah, right, that's what I'm saying here. The relative frequency of S intersect P in P, relative frequency of S in P minus eta is infinitesimal. And Q is less or equal than the number, than this relative frequency of which, one of these relative frequencies of which you want to take a supremum over all P. And now it's a pretty straightforward to see that this gives the right thing. Uh, and it is also pretty straightforward to see that this formula is equivalent to first to this formula where you pull the quantifiers out and combine i and j, you can use the same i and j. Uh, next thing you can do is you can re exchange the order of the existential and universal quantifier uh, because we have countable idealization, which I mentioned before. So instead of there exists a P such that for all standard i, one can write that for all standard i there exists P. And then uh, finally, something I skipped is that this is a special kind of formula for which standardization can be proved 
over uh, over natural numbers can be proved or, or over rationals can be proved in spot and that's uh, fairly simple but I didn't have time to to give the proof so in spot this set exists and its supremum is the relative density that that is needed for Yin's proof. Okay, so I think I'm done with all the interesting stuff. Let me just say some very, uh, maybe five minutes about the conservativity results. So these results are established by showing that every countable model of ZF can be extended to a countable model of spot. And similarly, every countable model of ZF plus dependent choice can be extended to a countable model of spot of Scott or Scots. Uh, the the forcing used uh, has been employed by Ali Enayat in second order arithmetic, and by Mitchell Spector in uh, uh, theory of large cardinals without the axiom of choice. So we have to modify the ideas in various ways, but. Uh, in any case, the simple situation is when you have the axiom of dependent choice. Um, so working in ZF plus the axiom of dependent choice, you just consider forcing with infinite sets of natural numbers ordered by being a subset. So stronger condition, the condition P prime, is P prime extends P or is stronger than P if, it, if it's a subset of P. Um, well, uh, what uh, finite number of uh, differences doesn't matter. So this is really equivalent to the forcing with the Boolean algebra of infinite subsets of N modulo the finite sets. Uh, this forcing, uh, when you take a countable model of ZF plus axiom of dependent choice, and you get the generic filter over this forcing notion, you get a generic extension M of G which is again a model of ZF plus ADC, and it does not add any new countable subsets of M, and especially it doesn't add any new reals, it doesn't add any new countable subsets. So G is an ultra filter on N inside of this M of G, and one can now construct the limit ultra power in the way I was going to outline, but in any case, in the usual way. In M of G, you have the ultra filter, you have an ultra filter, non principal ultra filter G. So you construct the ultra power first. Uh, the Losch theorem, Losch theorem will hold because you have the axiom of countable choice, the consequence of dependent choice, and uh, the functions are defined on N. So axiom of countable choice is all that's needed to, to pick a representative for the existential quantifier situation. And so uh, it is now easy to see that this ultra power uh, with M taken as the standard sets uh, is a model of Scott. Well, okay. And uh, if you iterate this in the usual way, uh, count it many times and take a direct limit, you get a model of spots. So this is all um, technically simple. Now, unfortunately, the case of spot plus or spot uh, is much more complicated. There are two reasons why uh, a model of ZF may not be easily extendable to an elementary extension using alter, using you know, elementary extensions. One thing is you may not have any ultra filters, which we already took care of in the case of ZS plus dependent choice. But the other thing is that even if you have an ultra filter, uh, the ultra power does not have to satisfy Walsh theorem. Yeah. So we have to force, if we work with ZF, we have to force both a generic filter and Walsh theorem in the corresponding ultra power. Now, uh, this is uh, based on ideas of spectra, I already said, but of course his case was simpler because in his case, he had the ultra filter already. It was some measurable ultra filter or something. Here we have to force both. Uh, I already said how to force the ultra filter. So now let's see how you force Walsh theorem. Well, the conditions are function. 
Well, the idea is since you don't have an axiom of choice, instead of single valued functions, you have to deal, you have to work with multi valued functions. So, the forcing conditions are sequences of multi valued functions, so to say, uh, for each. There are functions from natural numbers into the universe uh, such that uh, for some number k, uh, they are, uh, the, 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 the elements of q sub i are k tuples. So each q sub i is a set of k tuples and non empty. And we think of the i, we think of the uh, mth component of. Of a k tuple as the value of the mth function that is being added to make it a, an ultra power. So, uh, uh, so this is a proper class forcing. Uh, the conditions are sets, but the the set of all conditions, as you can see here, uh, takes values from you know there are any functions from n to v with some extra properties. So it's a proper class forcing, which collapses everything onto omega. But we don't care because we don't care about the, yeah, the forcing, by the way, the actual forcing is now a product of these two, of these two conditions. So conditions are actually, in the ultimate forcing are pairs, PQ, where P is, P forces a subset of omega and Q forces uh, a set of functions on omega. And uh, yeah, the, we don't care because uh, you know we don't care what ha what happens in the generic extension. All we care is that we get an ultra power or something that looks like it. And the reason why this works uh, so well is that one can prove a version of Walsh's theorem, air quotes, uh, which says the following: uh, If you take any epsilon formula with any parameters. Um, then uh, G and uh, yeah, I, I didn't describe the details of the forcing. So uh, the, there is a generic filter G, but we look at the uh, which is a subset of uh, which is a infinite sequence of functions. Well, the generic filter is two things. Uh, on N, it's an ultra filter on P, and on Q, it's a generic infinite sequence of functions from natural numbers into the universe. So uh, QN1 and QNS are the names for these generic functions, uh, N first, N second, and sub S1. Uh, so G1, there will be G0, G1, G2, and so on. So we, ch we this chooses some of these generic functions. So a condition forces that something is true about these generic functions, if and only if for almost all I in P, the formula is true for all possible values of these functions. You see, at the, when you have a condition, the condition only gives gives you a choice of multiple values at each level. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the formula has to be true for every way of choosing these values x0 up to xk minus one from the, from the forcing condition. So that's a sort of adaptation of Walsh's theorem to multi-valued functions. But of course, it doesn't do you any good until you have an ultra filter. Once you have that, you can uh, you can take the forcing theorem and Walsh theorem and deduce that the resulting uh, structure made of all these G sub N is a uh, model for a spot, spot, I'm sorry, spot. So that shows that spot is a conservative extension of ZF. Now to extend this to spots uh, seems to require an iteration of this construction at least countably many times. And unfortunately that seems very difficult. And uh, so far it's open whether it can be done. So I suspect, I mean, uh, 
one would expect it can, but the technical difficulties are, are huge. So I have to end here then. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll thank our speaker. Oh, let's see, how do I get? <laughs> and um, I can open it up for questions. Feel free to unmute and just uh, just start with whatever question you have. Oh, I'll get things started if you don't mind. Um, yeah, this is sort of a gen general question. This is, first of all, this is very, very beautiful work. It's quite exciting, really. Uh, but is there any connection in the ideas or intuitions with the semi-sets? Well, I would say... Uh, so. I would say not with semisets. Semisets, the, the book of Wopienka and Hayek on semisets axiomatizes forcing. They explicitly do not deal with non-standard analysis there. So I would say a better question might be, is there a connection with alternative set theory? Um, again, alternative set theory as presented in Wopienka's book has just one level of standardness. Uh, does it use the axiom of choice? Well, uh, uh, probably not. I suppose the consistency of AST can be established relative to uh, maybe even piano arithmetic, I'm not sure. But the difference there is that, uh, of course, you cannot do much of mathematics in AST, much of standard mathematics and, and the corresponding non-standard mathematics in AST because you don't have, uh, you know, you don't have ZF. Uh, you have you have a system where uh, that Wopinga calls an alternative to or called an alternative to uh, Zermo, to Cantorian set theory, and it doesn't capture even infinite sets in, gen in any great generality and uh, so on and so on. So I would say the the point of our work is that mathematicians could actually do work in it. Uh, and you could certainly you could certainly teach uh, calculus in this way uh, because all you need to do is if you accept these axioms, which seem to me sufficiently intu intuitive on the basis of what I said about Leibniz, at least at one level, the, the multi-level is a different story. If you accept these axioms, you can work from these axioms uh, intuitively and uh, except for occasionally having to take care of standardization. It's, it's, it's pretty much what uh, any non-standard work would do, whether it's Wupin Castle, or whether it's uh, Kiesler or, or anyone else, I would say. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, anyone else? Okay, in that case, let's uh, let's thank Carl again. Thank you. That was a very excellent talk. We uh, we really appreciate it. Um, the recording will be up on YouTube uh, soon, uh, so you can uh, find it there. Uh, I will ask uh, if you can send the slides. Um, uh, it, then we can also include them on the NY Logic page. You can send it to me or to Roman. Um, sure, and th this would conclude our uh, seminar for the semester. And uh, stay tuned if, uh, for more details from Roman about next semester, if, you know, from Roman and, and myself and Vika. Um, so we'll stop here. Thank you.